Okay, we'll start over. All right. <laughs> How, how did you uh, go to work for Bob Dole? I had spent six years in Vietnam, a year in Iran. I lived on the West Coast in San Diego with my wife and two children then. Decided to pack them up, drive to the East Coast to seek fame and fortune in Washington. Unfortunately, it was the Carter administration. He was downsizing. And I'd get interviews with different people and for different government positions, but uh, nothing was there. One day I'd been introduced to Bill Taggart. Uh, Taggart said, I think I'll uh, introduce you to Dole. He, I think he'd like you. You look like a former AA of his. Taggart did introduce me, and not unlike your own experience, uh, within 30 minutes or so, I had a job. After, However, I had explained to the senator I had no experience in Washington, didn't know anything about running a Senate office. He said, you can run things, and you're a combat veteran. That's good enough. Now that, and that's exactly what happened. What, was he a creature of impulse like that? And, and I, when personnel matters, he was. Yeah. He, I found that the senator, and we used to joke about it among the uh, Nutter and Jack Nutter and Ernie Garcia and people like that, that when you didn't work for him, he coveted you. <laughs> and he always thought all the other members had better staff. And then as soon as you came to work for him, if you were stupid enough to have come to work for him, you must not be smart enough to work for him. What, what is that? And the, but as soon as you left, his staff, it, my experience, and I think it's everyone, he was unfailingly helpful as much as you couldn't ask enough of him, and he, he would he'd deliver. What does what that I mean, I know he's 40 now, but what does that say about his ego? If, if, I, I think he if, really questioned his own, yeah. his own uh, capabilities and his, you know, his own ego. It's very much like uh, I used to see in floor statements and, and speeches. I'd, when I first got there, I'd say, well, you know, what do you, what's your position on such and such? And he, he wanted me to tell him what his position was and why. And he would either like it or not. But if he didn't know why he'd like a position, he wouldn't tell me why. He just wouldn't like it. So like a lot of members, I think he knows what he didn't like. He didn't know what he liked. Uh -huh. At least that was my experience with him. Yeah. Were there um, qualities that you think uh, he looked for in staff? Or was it more kind of almost hit or miss chemistry? Well, I don't... No, I, I don't... I, I think these were all impulsive. I don't know that there was any qualities that he had in some checklist in his mind. I can remember one of the things he said to me after about four months in the job. He said, well, most of the staff really likes you, he likes you and likes working for you. It's the only positive thing he said. Now, that, of course, let Betty and uh, what's her name, Joanne, uh, outside of that. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd cover for the staff, you know, when they got in trouble and, and whatnot. I remember during one of those late-night October sessions, uh, Mary Wheat was long scheduled to go on a drive through uh, the changing trees and somewhere and her, her bill was there was nothing that we were doing on it it was around one o'clock in the morning i said to leave and i'll cover for you and i stayed there all night and Dole was furious when she wasn't there and i said well i got it we're not going to do anything on the bill i'm, I'm there and, but he was just furious that i had let her go uh but he he was furious but he never said anything other than you could tell he was just really pissed off Tell me about his anger. I mean, was he an angry man? Yeah, I think he was. Um, even his humor. I, I think he was angry at what happened to him. He, uh, I've thought a lot about it. I don't have any more insight than Noel Cook or someone like that would give you. Know, I hope you have talked to Noel we will. or Will. Uh, some of his humor was actually kind of biting. I mean, it's one thing to say I want to be vice president because it's indoor work and no heavy lifting, which is quite a... What a funny remark and kind of humorous. It also says something else. Um, <laughs> sort of the Roger Mudd question to, to Ted Kennedy in 1980, I guess it was. But um, it, some of it was actually kind of biting. And I think it was all directed at some angry head at himself. Himself or fate and, and the well, war. Fate, fate or what's and happened the, to him. And I'd, I'd heard from a gazillion of his friends that... that uh, Friends, which was a very 
I would have used the term acquaintances. Yeah. I wouldn't use the term friends. I don't really had many friends. Uh, you got a lot of acquaintances, but they'd all say what a wonderful athlete he was, what a wonderful surgeon he was going to go, and all of a sudden that went away in one short afternoon of combat in Italy. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of anger. Maybe at fate is a better way to put it. You wonder, though, was there a time when it, it dawned on him that, okay, fine, all of that went away, but look at what I've been able to do in no, its place. No, I, I think I, of course, I'd left him. When he became majority leader, I can remember being up in either the Intelligence Committee or in 407, one of those Senate rooms and that's, that's classified, with Colin Powell as a National Security Advisor. I was an Assistant Secretary of Defense. He was leader, and he called us up there uh, to because we were having some trouble on something called Operation Frequent Wind, which was, free, no, Operation Earnest Will, which was the reflagging of the Kuwaiti tankers, and very controversial at the time at the nadir of the Reagan presidency. Uh, and here he was, the majority leader of the U.S. Senate, the majority leader of the U.S. Senate, the world's greatest deliberative body. And he didn't seem to have, to me, a sense of how huge that really is. He acted, uh, in fact, he just said, basically, well, uh, turned to the other senators and said, you wanted the brief, and here got the National Security Advisor and Assistant Secretary of Defense up to give you the brief. None of the sort of real... I'm the majority leader. I got these guys up here because you want them. You know, I'm I'm in charge here. None of that. None of it. So I don't think he ever it, it, it ever occurred to him how much he'd accomplished. You know, it's interesting because people all talk about the war, uh, uh, leaving that permanent, obvious stamp on him. But I've often thought they 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 tend to overlook the depression. And growing up dirt poor in rural Kansas, because I've always thought there's a streak of the populist in Dole. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I grew up relatively poor, son of a cop. But it was a different time um, in the country, though he's certainly senior to me. But it wasn't the Depression, but it was before and after the war. My father was a cop. We didn't have any money. Uh, but everything was possible. So I took a different lesson away uh, than a depression. So I, I don't know that, I'm not sure how much that's it, because he was a much admired figure as a young man. So he had to work in high school, big deal. Who didn't? Who didn't? But he was a three-sport athlete, as I recall. Everyone said he was destined for this, that, and handsome beyond you know, really yeah. handsome. Now look at him well, now. Fine figure of a man. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, so in I the think sense he, that, he had a lot going for him. Oh no, but I mean, yeah. I, I mean, taking away the kind of when I talk about populism, the, a kind of um, well, you know, a resentment of pomposity, uh, the flaunting of wealth, uh, privilege. I mean, you know, some of the remarks about Gucci gulch and all of that, and the and the kind of unconventional conservatism. Fair, fair enough. He certainly was not any of those things. He didn't go to the glitzy. He didn't, when he became much more well-known, he didn't go to the, Yeah. Uh, he wasn't always pushed into the front of the line. It's probably one of the better things you can say about the senator. He, he always knew who he was, I guess, uh, to some extent, to some extent. Hmm. But he never knew what he wanted. Really? He knew who he was to some extent, but he never knew what he wanted. Because, and of course, that the conventional notion is: here's a man who is single-mindedly driven with a goal in mind, i.e., the presidency. Um, I wonder when that that hit him. Uh, I, well, it, it clear to me, he didn't have that goal in mind until he was the number two. And I, I saw him one night when I first met him. I just started working for him. He had an apartment at the Watergate, and I, he asked me to come over and see him. He and Mrs. Dole, first time I'd met her. And No, I, I guess I'd seen her in the office, but it was the first time I'd ever been in their, their apartment together. And uh, 
she offered me a Coke or whatever and put some peanuts on it or whatever and, and, and said, Bob, is there anything I can get you boys? And then she was going to go off and do whatever she wanted. And he said, yeah, 5,000 votes in Ohio. <laughs> this was two years after <laughs> after that. Revealing. Yeah. yeah. But I, I came home and told my wife, I said, baby, if I ever spoke to you that way, you'd kill me. She said, yes, I would. <laughs> and, and I also can contrast that with Ford's. I mean, Ford would not have said that two months after, let alone two years after. No, I, I think that he didn't. So there's a scar. I mean, you think 76 left scars. You remember, he also said Democratic Wars. Right. That was something you just couldn't. It was unbelievable. Did you, did you ever hear him explain? No. How it, no. How it happened? No. I've heard explanations of it. I've never heard him, and I wasn't going to talk to him. It was, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And that's not what cost Jerry Ford the presidency, but it was, right. it was such a, such a bad sign. He still is extremely sensitive. Um, I don't know what happened. He asked me, this is within the last year, it was before the president died, but he told me he'd run into Steve Ford at something, and he said he wouldn't shake his hand. And I thought to myself, that's crazy. Jerry Ford wouldn't shake his hand? No, no, Steve, the son, you know, the Dole. And, and I thought, no. that, that's, that's just crazy, you no. know. He must not have, yeah. you, know, you know. But the fact that he was that sensitive hypersensitive. Yeah. But that's crazy. The, the Fords are a better breed than that. Yeah, yeah. But Jerry Ford did a lot more damage with his comments about captured nations and whatnot. But, but, well, but, I, mean, but I, I, I would not know if Bob Dole... Uh, I left him, I think the last day on the payroll was the day he declared for the presidency in 78, 79. Because I thought to myself, he can't be president. He doesn't know what he wants. You have to know what you want. Be president, you have to go to want to take the nation there. He knew what he didn't want. What's the what did he not want? But he didn't know what he wanted. He didn't know where he wanted to take us. Yeah, as a nation. Tell me about um, Joanne and Betty. Joanne. Joanne Coe was an extraordinarily competent political operative, knew where all the bodies were buried, I mean nothing nefarious in that, but she knew yeah. the history, Kansas yeah. politics, and Senator Dole, knew who had given what when, who was on what list, etc. He would tell me to fire her about once every two months. And On what grounds? It didn't matter. She'd drinking or she was pissed off, you know, said something to somebody right. and it got back to him. Yeah. And uh, the first time I actually did it, and she said, no. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm sorry, but uh, that's that. And, you're, and I kept him out of it. I said, it's just been disruptive and too many complaints. And I didn't say that. He told me to fire. She said, no. That's, that's not going to stay. This apparently had happened to her before. She went in to see Dole. He called me back and said, well, maybe we'll give her another chance. <laughs> so the next several times he told me to fire her, I knew. <laughs> Just go in and yell at her or, or not, you know, yeah. tell her to chill or, you know, keep a low profile for a while, not to be fired. But she was indispensable in that way to him. She knew everything about politics, and particularly Kansas politics, that he knew. Hmm. And so, I mean, they were, they had a, a very strange bond that way. Yeah. And Betty? Well, Betty, uh, I, I know the stories about Betty, that that uh, he had uh, hired her off an airplane, that she had been a stewardess. I don't know if you'd heard this. And I, she was already well established by the time I got there and uh, ensconced outside his office. And she always struck me as kind of a schizophrenic. On the one hand, she could be enormously pleasant and nice. She'd go into enormous rages at him, but as soon as he the door opened, she was just senator, no senator, and uh, there was no question that. And both Betty and Joanne's position in the office was always something I think that frustrated every AA he ever had, 
because they were marching to a different drummer, uh, and uh, they did it their way, and they were very mischievous with staff. Uh, they would try to pit people against each other just because they could. It was nothing personal. It was all business. And th the end of the day, it was to make two people indispensable to Senator Dole. Do you think that happens a lot in Washington? Yeah. Or I, is that an extreme example? No. I, well, I think this was, a, as I've found out from a lot of the people who were AA, you know, Mitch Daniels and others, these were guys that Senator Dole said, go down to Luger's guy, he'll teach you how to be an AA. So it was Mitch Daniels, and we became friends. <laughs> then he really, he taught me a lot. But he said, you know what you're getting into up there? And I said, no. And he told me the Betty and Joanne story. So it was, it was a understandable and not uncommon phenomenon raised to an art form in Dole's office. I think. <laughs> to, to clarify, so you were hired by Dole yep. to be an AA, I would do his, although yeah. you'd not had any previous Zero. experience. Didn't you think that was a little odd? Yeah, very odd. I was delighted, though. <laughs> but I, like most of us, I'm a legend in my own mind. I figured this would not be a problem. And, uh, thought there was no higher praise, and after about four months, he says, "You know, staff really likes work for him. Most of the staff, something like that." But it, so, uh, do you think he meant that as a compliment? Yeah, actually, I think he did. Yeah, uh, no, I don't mean to be facetious. Yeah, I, I, just, I think he did. That that passes as a compliment for him. And, uh, I mean, by then it didn't take long for Joanne and and uh, and Betty. I mean, for me to understand what was going on in the office. So. And I, I quickly realized they've got their position, and my job is to keep everything else running, keep the salaries relatively low. He wanted to give a little money back each year. Really? Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's, you know. Yeah. Like John McCain it does the same thing, you know, yeah. he's turning money back. Um, what, keep, was it, worked was, with Kim Wells, who uh, I worked with quite well. Yeah, well, tell, tell us about Kim. Well, Kim was a real... Uh, very glib and in a positive way, very articulate, attractive guy. I always thought he'd have a great political yeah. career, uh, but he never wanted to, to hang his neck out that much, which I respect, by the way. I'm not, that's not a criticism. Uh, and he, Dole would call him up, and a lot of the information I got around the office, it would, Dole talked to Kim, and Kim would come back to me and tell me what he'd said, good, bad, or indifferent who he was bitching about, who he was praising, and, and, you know, what's his problems or, or happiness with with me. And it usually always came through Kim. And the reason is Kim would only, he was long distance. It was a voice on the phone. He didn't have to have the interpersonal. So Bob Dole didn't like interpersonal struggle. He didn't want to have a fight with you. He didn't want to have a personal fight, and he didn't want to have a policy fight. He can, now, when he's on the floor of the Senate, he can stand up there and slug away, but he didn't want to do it in his office. That was my observation. And presumably that affected how you did your job in that were you, you were the instrument of his displeasure with people? or uh, I, I mean, did I, No, you, it wasn't. It, he left me alone to run things. I mean, so I was the, I'd cover for them or just as long as they, they all were pros. I mean, Ernie and Jack Nutter and the rest of these guys, so it wasn't like I was doing them any favors, but I, I wouldn't tell them the criticisms that would come unless it was a really valid one. Yeah. In which case I would dress it up a little bit. And I, and if, if there was something nice, I'd generally pass that on. But it all came through Kim. Really? Yeah, in 14 months, the only time I heard from Noel anything was the one time he said what he said to me. Would you, what kind of regular, if, did you have regular meetings with him? I mean, how did that? No, I could go in any time and tell him stuff, but he would uh, come breezing through. I realized early on he didn't want any political advice from me, and that was right because I didn't have any to give him. If I had something to tell him, I would do it. I generally let the AAs be the ones on the floor. I'd wander down there occasionally uh, just so I could understand what was going on, but I wasn't going to add to their knowledge. I would see him every day. Uh, but there was no regular time, and I'd stick my head in if I had something. Otherwise, not. That's the way he wanted it. He, I think, at one point while you were there, made the decision. And apparently, it was a difficult decision to leave the ag committee. Yes, yeah, and we we justified it. However, went to the finance committee. I helped hire Bob Lighthizer and Rod DeArmond and those guys. Uh, he was very nervous about it. And 
it was the leadership of the Ag Committee. It wasn't the Ag Committee. Mm. He would still be on the Ag Committee. Okay, I see. All right. But he wanted to take over finance, his ranking minority in finance. And uh, we talked back and forth about it. You'll still be on the Ag Committee. So you've got yeah. that. Yeah. And on finance, you've got the international trade aspects, which is very good to Kansas. And once that sunk in, he did it. That uh, was he. We talk about scars. Did seventy four leave scars? The Bob, the Roy, Doctor Roy. Yeah, I mean, in the sense that um, he, he he never quite felt as secure as perhaps. He, well, he, he might that have. was a vicious campaign, and I've only heard about it. Uh, also, talked to Nancy Kassebaum about it. Really? We became yeah, pretty good friends, and of course, she was out in Tokyo, and I'd see her all the time out there with her husband. Um, I think he did because it scared him, and he, he wasn't, you know, that's not a safe safe seat, and he really got knocked off, and then he had to stoop to things that I don't think were things that he enjoyed doing. Yeah. I don't think that he liked having to win that way, but he he always really hated. This is one of the reasons he worked so hard for Nancy, and by the way, so did I, because only a couple people could go and campaign. The senator and I think two others in the office were allowed, Joanne and me. So I went out for a week and campaigned around and uh, went with Bill Walford, who was the, the AA who I looked like. He was living out in Wichita, Wichita, I think, then, and so ran around and gave speeches for Nancy. Really? But yeah, he really wanted to win and wanted her to win. But same thing, he worked his ass off. They had a very good relationship? I thought so. Well, she always understood him. She knew Senator Dole exactly knew what he was and wasn't, uh, but she was very grateful to him. And, and how, what, how would you interpret that? In terms well, of it's, it's like, like um, Pat Roberts or then Keith Sebelius, all these people, they all knew Senator Dole. They'd all seen him. They'd been with him. That he's a very conflicted guy uh, who had a great talent, very, I would say, charismatic fellow, uh, but uh, had some. I think they they thought he was a little meaner than he had to be. Do you think a little rougher than he had to be? Let yeah. Me, let me not say yeah. meaner. Yeah. A little rougher than he had to be. Do you think that evolved over time? Do you think that um, as he was given responsibility, particularly after the Reagan victory in eighty, and and woke up to the realization that... I think um, it evolved for the positive that he got less... Than, yes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, right. I think he became more polished. Uh, he was still a pretty partisan guy, but it wasn't a mean, it wasn't mean spirit partisanship anymore. Uh, and even when he was, and I say rough, it wasn't a partisan roughness. Remember he had the Dole McGovern food stamp? Oh, yeah. Thing, and they worked very well with McGovern staff. Um I'll tell you a funny off-the-record anecdote uh, here in a minute. Uh, so he wasn't partisan. He could just be mean to people. He could be cutting to them. And that's the meanness or the roughness I was talking about. It wasn't a partisan roughness. Did you ever see him he got a, more genteel, I think, as he got... Did you ever see him apologize to anyone for... I never have. Yeah. I, I didn't. Yeah. I think he apologizes in different ways. I mean, he, he wouldn't say, I'm sorry, sorry I hurt your feeling. He'd give somebody a raise or he'd... <laughs> you know, yeah, he wasn't good interpersonally. Was what he was his fort? fiscally tight? Huh? Was he fiscally tight? Fiscally I mean, tight? Cons- yeah, in terms of I, things like I, salaries. This is, this and- is off the record. Right? Okay, <laughs> so did, did, back on the record. Did, yeah, did that suggest that money wasn't no money a big was thing never to him? no no. At, it wasn't that I ever saw. Right. No. Now, I mean, people talk about he's immaculate and. You know, clothes, and I mean, yeah, it was they, a great they weren't top of the dresser. line. They were Kansas clothes. Yeah. And, until he got to be majority leader, he was still dressed in Kansas. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't wearing uh, uh, Brooks Brothers. Yeah. When you talk about him being conflicted, do you think part of the conflict was this drive for the presidency? Yeah. That it coexisted with what we talked about earlier, doubts about really whether he was up to the job. Well, I didn't. There were doubts whether it was about being up to the job or not. I'm not sure. He, it had to bother him. You, you were talking earlier about being a speechwriter, and normally you'd go in and hear from the boss. And that's the way I did my speeches at State. I didn't write all these. I'd call in and say, here's what I want to say, and here's the thing I want to stress, and, and go through several drafts. That's kind of a normal yeah. way to do it. 
Uh, I think that bothered him. Really? Yes. Going through that process. That, that he, uh, you know, God, I, I'm, he didn't like that the staff would have to tell him what he liked. What do, you, why, what, what do you make of that? I don't know what to make of it. Yeah. I say he just knew what he didn't like. He didn't know so much what he liked. And it was always, it, it, it's, I think you look at it as a part of the sort of the, you must have heard this from others you've talked to before. Uh, staff uh, working for other people are all brilliant. And then if they're dumb enough to come work for him, they're not worth it. But then when you leave, he helps you. So it's just a funny part of Bob Dole's personality. Was everything he was doing at that point, the, the period you were there, uh, in some ways governed by 1980? Absolutely. The, the presidential campaign? A- abs- no, absolutely. Every speech, this is why I want to change it, here's what we want to hit, absolutely. He was working like a dog. Yeah. All around the country, working like a dog. And that campaign this was... when he made his happy Chinooga speech. What? We put a speech together for him, Happy Hanukkah, but we didn't tell him how to pronounce it. So he wished people a happy Chinooga. It's, that's it, that's <laughs> fascinating because I remember now that you now that you say that, I got a call from him. He was giving a big speech at the press club, and I had quoted, and it had to be the beginning of eighty because. Uh, it was after John Paul the First. Anyway, and I'd quoted John Paul the First, who talked about the the desert of modernity and yeah. turning modern man into automatons. So, uh, automaton. Uh, so he called me. Give him credit. He called me at home to get the pronunciation of the word. Now he, he screwed it up. What he did? But but he called. You know. No, I. Listen, and, which not everyone not everyone would do. It taught me a big lesson. Don't assume anything. Don't assume, and it's, it, it, there's a, a lesson for life. It's really helped me. Don't assume anything. All right, we've got a funny anecdote. You've got to talk to Bob Downen, right? What's that? You know Bob Downen. Bob Downen was the guy who was uh, with him during the Panama Canal Treaties. Oh, and okay. just after He went off to work uh, Taiwan issues or something. Uh, finally, it was through the Taiwan Relations Act. Bob's an interesting guy. Is he Bob, in D.C.? Yeah. Oh, great. D-O-W-N-E-N, Bob Downen. Great. When someone would leave the staff, they'd want to go in and have a picture taken with the senator. <laughs> so I'd get the senate photographer up there or have Betty get him, you know. And the guy gets in five minutes to say thanks to the senator and get a picture and whatnot. And later, go and sign it. <laughs> Bob Downen goes in. With a signed picture for the senator. Oh, no. To Senator Dole. This was a great time. We had a great victory. Sincerely or respectfully, Bob Downers had gave it to him. Oh, look at that. <laughs> and I laughed and laughed. <laughs> what made Dole laugh? Because it's interesting that it coexists with this anger that you speak of, this, you know, humor that was there. I never saw him generally laugh. Gen- I mean, as a belly laugh. Or right. Anything. Never. Yeah. Never. Have you ever seen him laugh like that? Not a belly laugh. Um, it's not easy to make him laugh. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've seen him I've seen him laugh. I mean, he, he's always got, even when he came in when I was deputy secretary, he was working with some people I didn't think he necessarily didn't should want to, but at any rate, he'd come in, and it was, it was, we used to joke in the staff all the time, and you, probably when you were there, you saw us doing, we had two, the first one would be, I don't have a pen, but pretend I've got the pen here, yeah. right? <laughs> hey, how you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> How's everything in Olathe? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, and then he'd go in and close the door, and he'd go, oh, oh, <laughs> ding, <laughs> The door would open. <laughs> we used to do that all the time. It was, you know, just being Bob Doyle, the senator from Kansas. <laughs> Why do you think there is this notion out there, or there was? I don't know that's still there. Um, but certainly at, at that point, there was this notion 
that somehow being married to Elizabeth had softened him, humanized him, taken off the rough edges, significantly, you know, affected, affected him. And um, I often thought that people had it backwards, that he taught her everything she knows about politics, that, that, that she, had, she had the degrees, but she didn't have the instincts. She still doesn't. Yeah, uh, and they were married when I knew them. So yeah, she, she kept relatively out of the office. Yeah, uh, she you know she was doing her own thing. I would work much more closely with her during the transition to Reagan in 1980, and she okay. was going in as labor, I think it was. Uh, but uh, she had an office right downstairs. I was in national security. And she was right downstairs, and I'd see her and talk to her a lot. Uh, I mean, it's hard to make a judgment on someone's marriage when you're not there. Enough yeah, to, sure. But certainly, to the extent she learned about politics, she would have learned it from him. He didn't learn anything about politics from her. Uh, and they always seemed to me to be kind of on their own paths and on their yeah, own tracks. Yeah. I mean, there is this notion that um, getting back to whatever insecurities he may have felt, the fact that at that point in life, he could woo and win, you know, the beauty queen, the uh, Harvard Law grad, the, I mean, not a trophy wife, but a, no, but a, but a very, very impressive, substantive, beautiful, uh, desirable woman. All true. Uh, you know, I don't know that he would have thought that way. I don't know how he thought. I just yeah. couldn't. But I, you, you will talk to Noel Cook because he knew the first wife as well. Yeah. And... Uh, Dole's daughter used to come by every once in a while. She was always one that no one understood. We kind of tiptoed around. She was fairly close to Joanne. Yeah. Uh, at one time, but we we were very cautious of her. I mean, because we didn't know what she thought or what she was doing. So, how did you set legislative priorities? Uh, there were none. There yeah. were no legislative priorities. Uh, he, at, when I was there, it was I uh, want a piece of legislation a day, and I want a floor statement on every issue. Uh, how, let me interrupt. I wonder how much of that maybe is the, the congressman in Dole. I mean, not having quite sort of, <laughs> I won't say grown up to, but, <laughs> but um, how much of that was still uh, the kind of Bob Dole that had been in the House? Because it sounds very much like uh, what a, what a well, congressman but, but, would do. Well, I, I looked at it in a little shorter time period. 74 with Dovern, I think it was 74 when they had the McGovern, wasn't it 74? McGovern food stamp? Yeah, yeah. This was something that was monumental. Yeah. It was huge legislation. It was one of the few with his name on it. And uh, he had to work it from beginning to end. I didn't know why he didn't learn the lesson that if it's something's worthwhile, it takes a, you know you got to really dig in. It's it's monumental. It takes a lot of work. Instead of having these pieces of legislation on every issue, which we would beat we, amendments on, he wanted amendments on every excuse me, uh, yeah. amendments on every. Issue. And I'd say to him, look, you can have amendments, and we'll get them through the office and see how germane they are. We can get that done in time, but some of these you're going to lose, you know, eighty to twenty. What's going on here? It's, but he just, I think, wanted the name out there. He wants people to see a very active senator. I thought that, it's, personally, that it was much better to be on the winning side of a few issues. Having a floor statement on each issue was much more understandable to me, and you know, also let people understand where Bob Dole is and, and whatnot. Uh, and actually, that was helpful because then I could use it to put together Dole Noodles letter and all that stuff. Not that I'd put it together, but we had the positions laid out there. Uh, and that was actually healthy. But the, the legislation, I think, was just an idea. He wanted his name out there. He wanted to be seen as an active guy. Were you of the, the relationship with Govern? I, I guess, had you come after Humphrey died? Uh, when did Humphrey die? He, well, died in late 77. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
I came in 78, March or so, 78. Okay, just a few months. Yeah. yeah. Did he, I mean, he had, did he have those kinds of relationships across the aisle? He had as good across the aisle as he had in the Republican Party, okay. I thought. So, I mean, his, par- his reputation as a partisan did not, on the face of it, preclude him from having working relationships. No, no. With- and look, it was a much, much different Senate then. How so? I will not tell you the senator, but here, here's an interesting thing. Now, yeah. Nancy was the first elected in her own right. Mm. The Senate that she came into was kind of an old boys club. They all had the hideaway offices. You used to go down there and have drinks. Dole wouldn't. Yeah. Most of them would. I one time in 2002 or 2003, I was briefing senators up in the, the, the secure room. And it was a big deal. I had over 90 of them up there. And after it was over, I mean, it went on for hours and hours. After it was over, one prominent Democrat was still up there. And I asked this Democrat, I said, what's happened up here? And I said, when I was Dole's AA and this person was up there, he said, this was a much different place. And you didn't have this toxic atmosphere. He said to me, women. And I said, what? He said, no, no, don't get me wrong. He said, it had to come. But it changed this place. No more jokes. No more sitting down in the hideaway office after work drinking. He said, that it really, if you ask me in a word what changed the U.S. Senate or Senate, he said it had to come. Time was here. But it was an interesting observation. Very interesting. It was a very different place in the 70s. Was it much more collegial? Much. Yeah. Now, I know stories of people beating each other with canes and all years ago, but I mean, you'd go off with Pat Leahy and sit in his hideaway office. That wasn't. It wasn't always a good thing, but it was much more congenial. And people would fight on the issues, and they'd they'd be pretty good uh, afterward. Here's an interesting thing Dole taught me. Uh, just it's kind of the way he, he's a very disciplined guy, as you know. He said, "Look, uh, when you're AA, uh, I'll go to the A receptions at night, and you go to the B receptions. Make sure they know that I'm represented." And he would pick which ones he was going to go to. And on any night in Capitol Hill, there'd be seven or eight of them. And he'd go to the three big ones or four big ones. He'd go by and stop by. And I'd go to the others. And the LAs who had specific responsibilities for any particular group would, would go. He said, you can do what you want. He says, but my, I come here and I just have a glass of, of a soda. He said, because I've seen too many guys up here. They go to two or three receptions. They have a glass of wine at each reception. Then they go out to dinner, and the next thing you know, they've had a bottle and a half, two bottles of wine. And it catches up with you. He said, what I do is after I finish, I go home or go wherever he goes. He'll have fruit, cheese, and a half a bottle of wine. I remember it very well. And it taught me a good lesson. To this day, if I go to a reception, I don't drink. And I like to drink. Yeah. But I will not drink at a reception. That, you know, is fascinating because you're right. In many ways, he is incredibly disciplined. Mm. But in other ways that you would think would be critically important, you know, like preparing for a debate, he, he's the most undisciplined man I can imagine. And and, and fa- fathom that. I mean, explain it. that. It's, it's, it's a discipline almost of an athlete. It's not the discipline of a scholar and a discipline of a... Of a, of, a, of a professional uh, in, in, in a specific field. But it's the discipline of an athlete. He's got endurance. He's yeah. got stamina. He can be extremist when he needs to be. But it goes back to not knowing what he doesn't want, uh, what, he, what he wants. There's a sort of an intellectual rigor that well, you'd have to subject himself to, and he wasn't willing to do it. Not far off from 43 in that respect, Yeah. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I remember Evans and Novak wrote a book on the first year of the Nixon presidency in which they argued that Nixon wanted to be president without really knowing what he wanted to do as president. And I think that's a little unfair in terms of foreign policy. But clearly, Nixon didn't care about domestic policy. Remember, he used to refer to it as uh, funding outhouses in Peoria. I mean, you know, well, 43 didn't have an idea what he wanted to do. 
unfortunately, until after 9-11. Yeah. And that then he got the wrong lesson, I think, uh, very much, and he's really put us in a hole. Yeah. Really put us in a hole. Yeah. As a nation and as a party. Let me ask you about uh, Dole's relationship with Colin Powell. Yes. And how it may have evolved over over time, and in particular, to what extent, you know, did Powell seriously at any time think about running in 96? And I remember, I'm preface this, I'll never forget, because it's the only time I've ever had it happen to me, um, Time Magazine ran a cover of Powell, and inside, but inside the story was ostensibly about Dole. And someone had leaked a memo. I was out in California at the Reagan Library. But, I, you know, a, a kind of a let Dole be Dole memo that I had written saying, you know, you were a better candidate in 88 because you were more authentic. And you can go on feeding the crocodile as long as you want, but the fact is you're undercutting the very authenticity that is your best, your wow. strong suit. Wow. And the, and the fascinating thing is, and I've kept citing chapter verse, he leaked. He did? He leaked the memo. And he said he kept the memo on his desk, and he looked at it every day, and he sent it over to the Well, you can imagine how popular it made me with the campaign, you know, because you had all those folks who were, remember the Hollywood speech? and I mean, no. he was trying to outright the right, and it just, it, the body language wasn't there because that wasn't who he was. In 96, first of all, with Powell, then with Powell and Dole. In 96, Powell very much thought about running. And he had two guys, Kenny Duberstein and me, who would be at his house quite often at night, and we'd debate this. I did not want Colin Powell to run. Kenny Duberstein did want him to run. Paul was very conflicted because he'd get out. He was out after his book, and he was very famous, and everybody was telling him he's the man, and you got to do it. But what conflicted him was he he said they want me to come in on a white horse and fix what's wrong. That's not our system, and you have to get out at the school board and the you know the county boards and start the electoral process there if you want to change what's wrong. And so he was conflicted between the adulation he'd get on the one hand and his good common sense on the other. That but is that the soldier in him? I mean, that almost sounds like Eisenhower. I mean, people who the, say, this, I, this is him. Yeah. This is him. What he got up, he, he said to me one day, he said, on mornings that I'd get up and think I was going to run for the presidency. And it was a day-by-day -day thing. It would really? change. He'd say, I'd have a terrible day. And mornings I got up and said, I'm not going to run, I'd have a wonderful day. He lost about eight pounds. I mean, he's just going nuts. We had a big shootout at his house. Not a nasty one, because Kenny and I are friends. Uh, and Alma came up and sat with us. And she just sat there, because she'd seen all this going on every night. And she just sat there and listened to the argument. And then she had said what she said to Colin. So then he says to me, I'm going to give a press conference out here in Arlington. I'm going to get out of this, or Alexandria, get out of this thing. Fine. And he went up to Pennsylvania, went up to Philadelphia, and I'm in my old office, and I get a call from Alma, and she's screaming at me. She said, he's going to run, now you can't let him do this. I said, wait a minute, Alma, Alma, I'm on your side of this. What are you talking about? I just talked to him this morning, he said he's out of it. He said, I just got off the phone with him, he's thinking about it again. So I called him up right away, and he said, I know, Alma called you, right? I said, yeah. He said, I'm not going to do it, I'm out. And so he got out. Dole called me to come down to his office. He had down, down uh, by the railroad station somewhere in his 96 office. And they were all the same characters from the old Kansas days around, which was not a good sign. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And he had, a, as I remember, office right on the top, and he was standing there, and he, he wanted me to see if Dole would run with him, if Powell would run with him. And I said, well, he, I've got to ask him, but I said, if you ask me, no. Why not? He says he's not, he hasn't got the fire in his belly for elected office. He just doesn't have it. He can't do what you do. And I don't mean that in any way, but right. he just can't do it. 
He doesn't have the fire worthy of the supporters. And that's what he would tell you, but I'll talk to him. Well, when I told Powell, he just you know. Now, Powell got along fine with him as national security advisor, had to work with him a lot on such issues as contra funding and whatnot. But Powell had to do it all. The leader didn't push the issues. When you say there's an... People would never associate this word with dull. I saw it in Ford, too. Um, a passivity? No. A judgment about how this thing might play out. The Ernest Will uh, situation I told you about going up there and having to face the snarling beast. Literally, the leader said, uh, well, here they are. Guys, you want them? Here they are. And they left it to us to make this, this argument without any help from the majority leader of the U.S. Senate. This is from a Bob Dole who one time told me that we Republicans aren't fit to govern. Really? Yeah. What do you think he meant? He meant that we're good in opposition. <laughs> Not bad. No, you know, and in fact, well, you stop and think. If you're the party that thinks government is the is the problem, you do have to go through some mental right. uh, gymnastics. That's right. To then govern. To govern. But he, I can remember saying we're not fit to govern. That's the problem with us Republicans. How did um, how did your time there end? I mean, is, the day is he, uh, he was, it was clear he was going to declare for the for the presidency. I knew that he, I couldn't support him for the presidency. Yeah. I think I could have stayed on there plenty. I, I mean, no one told me I had to leave or anything. But it was just that I wasn't learning anything new, and I wasn't helping him. I wasn't hurting him, but I wasn't helping him. Uh, I wouldn't. In fact, I went right over to forty one's campaign. Did you? Yeah. A man that I consider, just by the way, yeah, the finest man, yeah, to be in the White House, not president, right? He was not a fine president. Yeah. He was adequate, yeah, but he, he was a fine man, yeah, probably probably Ford like, yeah. I didn't know Ford like I knew forty one, forty one, yeah. and clearly there was no love lost between Dole and Bush. I mean, in the sense that um, in forty one. Yeah. No, yeah. who? None at all. I mean, and that's where, I mean, the, I assume on the on Dole's part, resentment of... Yeah, je- jealousy. How did he do it? You privilege. Know, just, having everything exactly, handed to him. Exactly. Privilege. DFC. Uh, great war hero. Well, Dole was a war hero who had a disability that, he, that hindered him his whole life. Here's Bush... 41 escaping again, not understanding the fact that he was the youngest pilot in the Navy and yada, yada. So. Have, you ever fig- have you ever figured out the Nixon-Dole relationship? Because no. on one level, here's a guy, I, I mean, Dole... I've looked at the tapes, and, you know, then see what they say. They, they both have their dark sides, and had the two of them been together, in a way, this could have been very... This, look what's happened here. It, it could have been sort of an early version of what we have now. <laughs> Two people with dark sides kind of feeding on each other's fears and anxieties. And yet, boy, I tell you, Dole worshipped. I know he does. Nixon. And I, 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 I wrote the eulogy that he did at the Nixon funeral. And the thing is, I am convinced that we'll, to the day I die, Nixon never did an uncalculated thing in his life. And he stopped and think. <laughs> Who did Nixon have as you were just at Mrs. Nixon's funeral? Bob Dole and Pete Wilson. Yeah. Well, those were his guys for '96. Yeah. And he knew, he knew Nixon could, he knew Dole couldn't get through a eulogy without breaking down, and it would be the best thing that could happen to Bob Dole for people to see him human. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's exactly what happened. And um, but you know, but yeah, I mean Nixon is notwithstanding. The way he was treated. If he something as simple as saying, "Well, it wasn't the president, Haldeman, and Earl Green, it's always it's always someone else." I mean, like Rockefeller blamed Rumsfeld, you know, for the way he was treated in the Ford White House. It's it's never the president. Right, right. Even though it's the president. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The uh, 
Yeah, I think 41 and uh, Dole both are in seats. Look, they had too many of the same posts. And one guy. Well, and that's the other thing, remember? Yeah, I mean, and, and in fact, Dole talks about. I mean, Nick, again, it was Nixon who was pulling the strings. Dole literally did not know, or he claims not to have known, when he was sent off to, quote, persuade Bush to take the job. Who knows, Which, who knows the truth of it? Yeah. But it must have stuck in his craw. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. He's, uh, you know, he should have been Irish, Bob Dole. <laughs> Got Irish Alzheimer's. Forgets everything but his grudges. <laughs> Finally, because we've talked about this a lot, but uh, what do you admire in, in Dole? What do you think? Um, I think the, the thing I admire most is his overcoming his handicap. I didn't uh, admire his management style. I admire his energy, always have, and I admired his, his working through uh, his disability. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs and how depressed he was and how, you know, and all of these things. But I did admire that. There's one other thing that we haven't mentioned that I admire. I think he had a genuine compassion for the captive nations. He was very mm -hmm. steadfast on it. It wasn't like his support for Taiwan, which is kind of a traditional Republican thing. This was something that he believed. Yeah. Uh, and he was pretty good uh, on all the Helsinki stuff, uh, at least from my observation. Yeah. Genuinely good. Uh, and I admired that about him. I didn't admire the way he ran his office, and I didn't. But most senators don't run their office. And I didn't admire his his uh, lack of any management skills. But uh, I, th I think that he taught me a lot about, you think you got it bad? Just get up and get cracking. <laughs> Do you think there's some connection there between why why we don't elect senators to, to the presidency? Yeah. I mean, the combination of, 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 of that... But also, isn't it true that you get in this cocoon just in terms of the word, the vocabulary that you use? Yeah, uh, I, I think that those senators who have been elected have been a mixed bag. I mean, Kennedy never finished, and Johnson. And, uh, the, look, I, I've got a real prejudice on this, Rick. Uh, and most of the senatorial class are privileged. Most, not all. And those presidents who history judges is great are generally people who have endured enormous hardships mm -hmm. in their life. Whether it was a George Washington who lost more battles than he won, or yeah. a Lincoln who self made, or a Roosevelt who didn't gain the use of his spine until he lost the use of his legs. Even a Harry Truman, for that matter, failed haberdasher, failed politician, and one born a man who knew war. So there's something that sort of yeah. self-limits you as a senator because most of them don't have that. Now, McCain's an exception. Yeah. McCain has never run anything. He was a pilot, but he's got enormous, if you put some credence into what I said about those who history judged great, having suffered great hardship, McCain might be the pick of the litter. Pick of the litter. But senators Boy. aren't decisive, generally. I think Mrs. Clinton will be a little different. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. But, see, she's competent. Yeah. I don't care for her. She treated me fairly. I mean, and I don't like her as a person. I had to deal with her pretty closely in, as deputy secretary. Yeah. But she's competent. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. And competence counts for a lot. It's funny. Um, well, this is great. Um, we'll, we'll finish. I, I was out in Houston. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, we turned off. Uh,